Looking forward to getting into the Word of God and continuing our t- time in this, our current studies on the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and today looking at gentleness. And I want to begin as we introduce the subject in Galatians 5, what we are studying is primarily not a list of to-dos. It is not a list of work that we must do or things we need to get busy doing, but it really describes a multifaceted work of the Spirit of God in those who believe in Christ. And so last time when we were together, we said that this, this list of things that we are seeing here that the Spirit is producing in us is first and foremost something or that which describes who God is. And so when we come to the fruit of the Spirit, we should, we should center our gaze on God and the fruit that God is producing in us. And secondly, and really first and foremost as well, as much as they are theocentric, they are also Christocentric. Right, And so these things which are descriptive of God and Christ, when we are united to Christ through the gospel, these things, the Spirit, God the Spirit begins to produce in us, in believers, and he does that in increasing measure as we grow in trust in Christ for our salvation. And so what we are seeing in Galatians 5, it is Paul contrasting the works of the flesh of the fall of, of fallen man with the fruit that God the Spirit is producing in the redeemed. And so gentleness is seen as the counterpart of the works of the flesh. It is the counterpart. It is the opposite of what we see uh, prior to the fruit of the Spirit in such, such as things like outbursts of anger, for instance, or self-indulgence, selfishness, or uh, have, being intractable or unruly in spirit, someone who is utterly lacking self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is the counterpart to the f- to the, the works of the flesh. It is the opposite. The works of the flesh we do in our own strength. The fruit of the Spirit, God does in us. God does in us. And so in this penultimate session of our series, we will focus on the grace of gentleness. And we'll try to, we'll try to hit on everything that I have here, but this is our flow as follows. It'll be defining gentleness a look at the gentleness of God and Christ in the Old Testament, right? It's interesting that you might think, well, where is the gentleness of Christ in the Old Testament? I will show you where it is. Uh, And then we'll look at the gentleness of Christ in the New Testament and look at something of the gentleness of the saints, right, and how we are called to imitate Christ in his gentleness. And so with that, we will go ahead and begin with uh, a question for you before we go to the next slide. Um, what is gentleness? And how would you define gentleness, right? It is that which the Spirit is certainly working in us, producing in us, and how would you define what that is? Kindness. Kindness. Kindness is absolutely involved in gentleness. It is an inextricable uh, element of what gentleness is. Brother Chris. Tenderness. Godly tenderness. Yes, I love the word tenderness. When I think of, um, when I think of words that define gentleness, tenderness is such, is such a, a fitting word for what gentleness is. What, what else, how else do you define or maybe do you describe gentleness, right? Yes. Patience. Pat. Patience with compassion. Patience with compassion. That's a beautiful uh, combination and understanding of gentleness. And brother, were you going to add something? Yeah, you ah. <laughs> compassion in action. Ah, I like that. And then what did you say, brother? Of comfort, yes, man. Uh, those who are gentle are certain. There's certainly so much comfort in uh, uh, seen in that. And yes, are there two answers or just one? Is that a unified hand or is that two hands? I actually went back to my notes because I took out the word Oh yeah. And he said it's mildness, mildness in dealing with others.
Mm, that's good. That's really good. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. I read that too. That was, he did it. He did. That was a great chapter. Yes, brother. Mm hmm. The opposite of harshness. Yes, that's right. Uh, gentle harshness, and we'll see that soon. Harshness is the absolute opposite of gentleness. Um, in this book here, which I commend to you, this book is called *The Character of Christ* by Jonathan Cruz. Jonathan Cruz, and it is an exposition of the fruit of the Spirit uh, alongside Jerry Bridges' book. And Jonathan Cruz, he defines gentleness uh, like this, and I think this is a really great picture. Gentleness is handling something that is fragile according to its nature. Handling something that is fragile according to its nature so that it does not break and so that there is not even the threat of it breaking. And so when we think about gentleness, and if you want to go to the next slide, brothers up there, when we think about gentleness, gentleness takes into consideration the different aspects of our humanity. When we think about age, gender, maybe mental development, when we think about children, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a level of uh, maybe a spectrum of gentleness from maybe when you're dealing with an infant as children get older, we may think about, um, I was even thinking about how um, in terms of age, we are, our gentleness might change and our approach to brothers and sisters in the church would change. And thinking about 1 Timothy 5, which is a really amazing passage, the type of gentleness um, that we, that we um, approach certain brothers or sisters with, we have in 1 Timothy 5, do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father. Isn't that amazing? The type of gentleness that we carry into our relationships that can be dependent on, on our age. Uh, to the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters. And so our gentleness, it is, uh, it's what I like about his definition, is that handling something fragile according to its nature. Um, that I will, that there's a certain gentleness that, that my children deserve that isn't the exact same that I might use with another brother or sister, but it is, it, is, it, is, it is handling or dealing with them according to their nature so that you don't break them, uh, so that you don't crush them. And so it takes into account these different aspects of our humanity as well as, trying to un as, well as understanding our mutual fallenness and spiritual weakness. So we are to deal with everyone with a level of care and courtesy. We are to have respect for them and we are to deal with them, as, uh, we are to deal with them in mercy. Gentleness lives in a way that is sensitive toward others, toward, in Jerry Bridges uh, and his definition, it lives in a way that is sensitive toward others, and when we say sensitive, we mean that we live in a way that is considerate toward others. We live in a way that is considerate to others, and that is commanded of Christians. When you think of Titus 3, where it says that we are not to be insensitive, we're not to be uh, we're, not, we're not to be malicious uh, in, uh, out in, the, in public or toward our public officials. Um, Titus 3 says, remind them to be subject to rulers and, and to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, and it says, showing every consideration for all men, showing every consideration for all men. And so gentleness is what it is by virtue of our consideration of one another. If you notice when you lack gentleness is when, is when consideration is, is pretty much absent from how you are talking to someone. Uh, you will probably lack gentleness if you are not considering them. And if you, if you are not bearing in mind um, if you're not bearing in mind some of these different elements of our own fallenness together, our own sinfulness together. 
And no, we'll say that sensitivity or gentleness, it is not an altar upon which we sacrifice truth. Some people might get those things confused. To be sensitive isn't therefore to say things that might be offensive, but that's not true. To be sensitive, it is, it is a vehicle by which, or this gentleness, it helps us and it serves us to speak the truth. Being gentle helps us to speak the truth in love. It helps us to speak in ways that God has commanded us. And so we don't, we don't sacrifice truth on the altar of sensitivity, which so many people, uh, when, when you talk about sensitivity, if they're really talking about the fear of man, they may justify uh, their own fear of man and call it sensitivity, but that is not that is not, we are to be first and foremost sensitive to the will of God, and then we are to gently speak the truth in love. Um, one such um, example of that is Galatians 6.1. For instance, and I put that here at the bottom, Galatians 6.1, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. You are to restore them in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. And so the one who restores, they should restore bearing in mind, considering that we are both fallen. We are to do it in a spirit of gentleness, and we should do it. Um, we should do it, acknowledging that you, right? Not only, not only are they the one who has sinned, um, but we together are both dependent on the grace of God, and that will help us to be gentle when approaching someone who has sinned and in need of restoration. That it's not just them who have sinned and have transgressed God, but We have both sin, and we sin daily against the God who has saved us. And so ultimately, we restore one another knowing um, as well that what defines you and I is, is our positional, it is our identity in Christ. What defines you and I when we sin is not that sin that we committed, but it is our, our identity. What defines me ultimately is that I am a son of God that I am a saint, and you should restore me if I fall into sin like a saint, like I am a son. And you should expect others to restore you if you have sinned to deal with you as a saint, as a daughter of God. And so gentleness helps control uh, the very attitude um, and manner of restoration. And to add to our definition, the Greek word for the noun gentleness is prautes, and gentle as an adjective is praus. And one lexicon defines praus as like this. And what you'll see is that, is that gentle is being defined as, it's so closely related to, and really it can be defined on a spectrum to mean at times humble, or to mean at times meek, gentle, considerate, and it's, it's kind of all those things kind of have a common core in this word gentleness, but there's so much overlap. But this is what it says, to not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance, to be gentle, to be humble, to be considerate and meek. Just to show you this, uh, this word prautes, for gentle. In the NASB, when you look at the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, Matthew 5, verse 5, the NASB, for instance, it translates the same word, blessed are the gentle. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. The ESV, uh, it translates it as blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, and that is the same word, and, and uh, some may say that there is a difference between gentleness and meekness. Um, I think Jerry Bridges actually says that meekness is more passive, um, and, uh, and how we, it's, it's, this, it's this strength under control, and gentleness is more active, I mean, this compassion in, in action, as Brother uh, Chris noted earlier. And so we have the same word. Any, um, any, any thoughts on that uh, as we continue? 
I'll continue to just to walk through here in this uh, as we work on defining these terms. Paul used the same word, prautes, in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, which is really a beautiful picture of gentleness in action. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and with patience showing tolerance for one another. Isn't that amazing? Showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And that is almost a great definition of patience because it includes all of those elements uh, or of gentleness. It includes some of those elements of what we are getting at. There's so much overlap. And this list is almost a synonymous, a list of synonyms with this word prautes. Humility, gentleness, and patience. Those really make up the elements of what gentleness is. And really, gentleness, if it's lacking patience, it isn't gentleness. If it's lacking humility, it isn't gentleness. And we are called to tolerate, with, tolerate one another with all three of these. And as you and I, we looked at this when we looked at uh, tolerating one another, bearing with one another, uh, when we looked at uh, loving the church in the series that we just preached, that when you and I begin to look down upon or, or, or are puffed up in our own thinking and impression of ourselves, we will lose humility and thus the ability to tolerate one another. We will lose humility when we lose the ability to be merciful and courteous, when we lose respect for one another, we will, we will lack gentleness. And then when we really just refuse to honor one another and tolerate our differences, then we will lose patience. And so patience, humility, and gentleness are these uh, are, are these inter, these, these uh, um, inextricably linked these, um, these ways, these elements of defining what gentleness is, and without patience for one another, we really can't be gentle. We'll just, we will lack patience. We will lack the ability to endure one another, which God says we should be patient, and His grace is producing that patience in our lives. To refer to, refer to more ancient times, if we go to the next slide, and I have a, a longer quote here. Sorry if you cannot see that as well. But to refer to more ancient times, these attributes were rarely seen as desirable or commendable traits in the Roman world in which Paul was a citizen of. It really is amazing. One author, he describes the ancient mindset as this, that gentleness may have been a grudging sort of virtue for Aristotle, but humility, which is closely related to gentleness, was generally despised in the popular culture of Greece and Rome. Isn't that amazing that humility was despised? In our, in our culture, humility really isn't publicly despised and, and thought of something that is uh, kind of shameful, but it was in that culture. And so you have humility, he says, was not a virtue at all. It was empath empathetically not one of the heroic virtues, not embodied by the best of men and women, and it wasn't seen as ideal. In fact, humil humility was generally perceived as a vice, as a weakness. Real men were neither gentle nor humble. Real men were strong, powerful, and dominant. Boasting about your superiority was not regarded as being in bad taste in the way it is in modern polite society. Boasting was a carefully cultivated art. It was a carefully crafted evil boasting. Yes, brother. That's interesting. Uh, it, I think, I, so I think what the culture deems toxic, for the most part, it is God's design for 
gender-specific distinctions and roles, but I do think there's a difference between what we're talking about in the Bible and what Rome was deeming as, um, you know, I think that obviously they were rejecting they were rejecting humility. They're, they, are, they, are, they are trying to establish um, what is virtuous in the eyes of man and completely rejecting humility as defined by God. And so I do think there's a, there's, there's a difference, but I think that they're both at odds and living in opposition to the Bible and to the Word of God. Absolutely. That's a really good question. Yep. Yes, brother. Yep. Yeah. They want to have that without Jesus. Yeah. And it seems and it seems that they're straw manning. Because what they're because I think what they're attacking in the straw man that they don't want men to be they don't want women to be dominated by men. That is their character of um, of submission and marriage and the Bible's position of gender-specific distinctions and roles and things like that. And so I genuinely think they hate God's design for the Bible. And I think that they slander the, the Scripture, of course, and they completely, uh, they completely wreck what's actually being taught in Scripture because they hate what is revealed. Yeah. I believe they caricature wrong, exactly, wrongly, and um, they, they very clearly hate the God, of, the God of the Bible also, but they also hate the, God's beauty in creation, God's beauty in His design for how men and women are to live, and He has uh, gender-specific distinct. He has made those distinctions, and He has also, those, He's made those, the roles as well between us evident and clear which obviously when we think about submission and marriage, our culture hates that. When we think about, when we think about uh, uh, women taking care of children, right, and not neglecting their home, our, 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 our culture would see that as being oppressive, whereas God sees it as uh, women living freely within, uh, living freely within um, His design for them as wives, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is why a crucified Messiah, a crucified Savior, was such a, 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 an abomination to them. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. No, I appreciate that. And even to add to that, that attitude of the, the, this ancient world, though it's not as common as you would think today, it's still very much alive and present in our day. And so when people think of strength, they do think of strength in terms of domination, right? Uh, they think of strength as, as putting people in their place. That's what's strong. That's what I need to do in, in the flesh. That's what man thinks. Whether you're a man or a woman, you need to speak your mind. Um, you, need to, you need to show off, right? You need to be on top. You need to give an appearance of strength 
to those around you. And that was, even if, if they even said, I was reading even in the Roman culture, even if you had nothing, make it look as if you did. <laughs> make, make it look as if you do have something. And that's why they would, they would, they would craft the, this art of boasting. And it was, it's really, it was the boasting that gave them the appearance of being great when in fact they were not. But gentleness and humility don't allow you to boast of yourself. They don't allow you to boast in this world. Gentleness is seen, as we just said, it is seen as, as weak and unmanly to many. But the opposite is the case. I think it was, I don't know who told me this, maybe it was K-Dub. He says, Shai Lin, in one of his songs, says, if you think meek is being weak, try being meek for a week. Try being meek for a week. And that'll give you the gist of uh, of just the impossibility of gentleness or meekness without the grace of God. True gentleness, it is God-centered. True gentleness is, is a spirit-empowered grace where Christians are enabled to be calm and caring. God allows us to be calm and caring. It is where Christians are enabled by God to be patient and tender-hearted with one another. And true gentleness, as I said, is unobtainable without the grace of God. And so let us, let us go to the next slide here and to the next section of our time here. And this is what I want to look at, our Old Testament pictures of the gentleness of God and Christ. And this is where we'll begin. If you'd like to open up your, your, your scripture, go ahead and open your scripture to, uh, to Isaiah 40. And I will go ahead and read this for us, and I'll try to get through some of these things a little bit more quickly since we're running out of time. Isaiah 40, verses 10 and 11. And this is what it says, Behold, the Lord God will come with might. And what I want you to see is that in the first section, as I've noted here, is that what you see what go together is power and gentleness and is the power and gentleness of God. It says, Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. And what this is reminiscent of is Psalm 23, of the shepherd character of God. That like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. This, this, this verse demonstrates how God is the shepherd provider of his people. And as God delivers his people from their enemies, you see the picture of God taking them away from exile and bringing them back. And he is a God who carries them in his bosom. He has this sheep in his arms. He tends to their cares and the crush and their crushed hearts like the chief pastor that he is. Isaiah 42, if you would just uh, go over just a couple of chapters. Isaiah 42, we see righteousness and we see gentleness. Isaiah 42, and this is an amazing verse on Christ, this is Christological gentleness in, Psalm, in Isaiah 42. In Isaiah 42, verse one says this, behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. And note the Trinitarian plan of redemption. The Trinity is all right here. I have put my spirit upon him. Every member of the Trinity present, and this is speaking about what the Messiah will accomplish in his mission. And he says, he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the streets. He will not be self-assertive. He will not be a, a forceful Messiah or an aggressive Messiah. He's not one who is going to fight back or pick up the sword. He's not going to shout down other military leaders. Verse three, continuing on to Christ's gentleness, a bruised reed he will not break, which means he will not cause further damage to the bruised, but he will heal. A bruised reed he will not break. 
He will not cause further damage to the bruised, but he will heal them. And a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will not exacerbate to the point of snuffing out the dimly lit wick by snuffing it out or by extracting the oil, but he will provide more oil to fuel a brighter and lasting flame. That is what Christ will do. He will faithfully bring forth justice. And so you have both of these pictures. You have the bruised reed and you have the dimly burning wick describing the frailty and brokenness of sinners. And we can say first and foremost of lost sheep, those who are experiencing the effects of sin, being bruised, being convicted by the Spirit of God and of the misery of being lost in need of Christ and to such that are bruised, Christ says, come to me. Come to me. Richard Sibbs, in this regard, he says, it is better to go bruised to heaven than sound to hell without being bruised, without being convicted of sin. And then as well, this speaks of sheep that are found. This is our condition. We are the bruised. We are the dimly burning wick. We are weak. We are a battered people who Christ is caring for. We are not a strong people. We are a weak people of a strong and gentle Christ, and he is caring for his people. And as a side note, we should also say that in our lives, God bruises and he bandages. This is what God also does. Not only does he heal us of our bruises, but he also bruises so that we might be healed. And so the bruising isn't bad, but the bruising is good and for our good. Hebrews 12 says that God bruises his children because he loves his children. He disciplines them because he loves them. He loves them. And it is in gentleness that God bruises his, his children, not in harsh, fierce, or threats of condemnation. It's been said that God comforts the afflicted and he afflicts the comfortable. And he certainly does that, and we are thankful that he does afflict us, that he does bruise us. Just a few verses on that. Psalm 119 is such a, a beautiful, a beautiful, um, pa- uh, there's, well, all of it is beautiful, but specifically there's about 10 verse section about how God bruises saints. Psalm 119, 67 says this, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. And that is a testimony of a child of God being bruised and brought back. Psalm 119, 71, I know, O Lord, or sorry, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. That I may learn your statutes. You see, when, when saints are afflicted, it is remedial. It is God bringing them back. It is God accomplishing his purposes that he will never leave you, but he will always bring you back to himself. He will remedy our straying by bruising us and bringing us back to live in harmony with him. In Psalm 119, 71, it is good for me that I was uh, afflicted. Or he says, sorry, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous. And then he says, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. God's gentle covenant care is because of his faithfulness to his people. That is due to who he is, and that is why God always cares for his people in gentleness according to the redemptive mercy, his redemptive mercy and love in Christ. God bruises us with his love because Christ was bruised with our condemnation. But the picture here is that of a reed which is a a tall piece of grass that is bruised and looks wilted. It is bent over, though it is not broken. Though it is bruised, it is not broken, and it is not beyond repair. And unlike other rulers of worldly kingdoms who care not about our fallen condition, who care not about our despair and heartache, Christ doesn't overlook those things, but in gentleness, he comes to bind the broken, not break them. He does not come to break, he comes to bind. And he delights to care for and apply to our wounds the balm of his gospel. He delights to save. 
And he came to cure and deliver sinners from this sin-stricken world. You think about Galatians 1.4, that Christ died, and it literally says, to rescue us from this, from this present evil age, to get us out of here, Christ died. And to usher in a new kingdom and a new heaven and a new earth. And just a few verses later, God, God tells us the purpose in which or why he sent his son. And it says this in verse 6 in Isaiah 42. I am the Lord, and I have called you in righteousness. Speaking of the messianic servant, he, he says, I have called you in righteousness, and I will also hold you by the hand. This is a father to his son. This is Christ. God says, I will hold you by the hand and watch over you, and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. Those who dwell in darkness from the prison. So what is Christ coming to do when he says, come to me? He is coming to heal the blind when he says, come to me. He is coming to set captives free when he says, come to me. And he is coming to deliver sinners from the domain of darkness when he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's amazing that from that, Christ takes these men who are, sub, who are, who are, who are of the devil's kingdom. They are his subjects, and they are prisoners, and it says that Christ brings them out of prisons. He will bring them out from the prison and from the dungeon, which is such an amazing picture that we have. But this is what Christ came to do. He, he came to rescue us and to call him to himself. Even as I read these passages, aren't you encouraged? Even as I was reading these, I was thinking, isn't the word of God such an encouragement to the lost that Christ invites them, come to me, come to me. And the motivations to come to him, Christ gives many incentives to come to him. And one of those is those who come to him will never be cast out. They will never be turned away. There is nothing in Christ to discourage sinners from coming to him. Even at G3, when we, were, when we were listening to Owen Strawn preach, he said, do not let your awareness of sin dwarf the love of God. Do not let your awareness of sin dwarf the love of God. Sin is not greater than the love of God. And to quote Richard Sibbs again, there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. And that truth alone should encourage sinners not to despair in coming to him who will receive them in gentleness. And this is our final, uh, maybe I can say, maybe this is the, our, our final um, verse here. You know, maybe, let me skip that, that verse here. When we go to the, the gentleness of Christ in the New Testament, and I will just read uh, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. You're more than welcome to turn there as I spend here, maybe just a couple of minutes here before we have to come to a close. Where Christ says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You will find rest for your souls. When we think about that yoke and the type of rest we will receive from Christ, where he says, where he says to us here, take my yoke upon you. Jonathan Cruz, he says, he, helpfully, he says this. He says that a yoke, a yoke was the heavy wooden contraption worn by oxen that kept them from moving, um, that kept them moving in unison, so in harmony, together, straight, in a straight line as they plowed a field. People would also wear yokes to help them balance weighty loads across their shoulders when they would carry water, for example. Yokes were useful, but they were heavy. But because Jesus is lowly at our level and knows our weakness, he gives us a yoke that we can actually carry without wearying, without wearying, without breaking us. In fact, what Jesus gives his followers is less a burden than it is a buoy, right? It's something that keeps us afloat rather than weighing us down. 
It uplifts us. And he says, those who are willing to submit to the instruction and lordship of Christ will find themselves uplifted for the Lord lifts up the humble. And that is what Christ does. He lifts up the humble. He is gentle and tender-hearted. He is lowly. He is humble. And like I said earlier, those two, they go hand in hand with one another. In fact, we could even say that humility or lowliness produces gentleness. And so in humility, Christ comes to us and he meets us where we are, as we are, not with a cold or a distant attitude, but with affectionate receptiveness and a tender heart of gentleness. And that is comforting. That is comforting that Jesus puts an end to all of our searching for rest, all of our searching for satisfaction and purpose. He puts an end by calling us to himself to rest in him. Amen? Amen, amen. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that, brothers and sisters. Let us take, we have about 12 minutes or so before our next service. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed our time in the word of God.